Father, sorry for holding you up, but we, this is Sunday. You conducted Mass here at this cathedral, uh, Immaculate of Mary Cathedral here in Mulibai, Apia, Samoa. We've come to the end of uh, a weekend, a very challenging and fruitful and um, a rewarding weekend for the parishioners here in, in Samoa, where you led um, a retreat after Easter last Sunday. But um, having come to that, to the end of your time here in Samoa, uh, what is what has the experience been for for you? What do you say about after doing these things for the last uh, two days? This is my second time in uh, Samoa. Well, actually, it's my third time in Samoa. The first time I was with the Protestant ministers. I was brought in by WAC, the World Association for Christian Communication, and to work with the ministers of various uh, Methodist and uh, other. Christian denominations. That was many years ago. Then I was brought back a couple of years ago by the Archbishop and the Bishop of American Samoa to um, run a retreat for the priests of both dioceses. And uh, it was during that time that uh, um, I was with um, uh, George and Rosita and uh, uh, Jackie and uh, Vincent at their home and they all found out about the retreat and they said, well, why can't lay people have a retreat like this? And so thanks be to God, it's taken a little while for us to organize it, but to come back. So to answer your question, what do I take away? Coming every time I'm struck by several things. Firstly, is the deep faith of the Catholic community of some more. Um, people here have got very profound faith in, and in Jesus Christ. The second is the joy of the community. Now, I know the Pacific nations generally are famous for their smile, for their welcome, their great hospitality, but this is a genuine joy. These are people, the community I encounter here, are people who really do love the Lord, and they want to serve him as generously and as wonderfully as they can. And that was so clear on the retreat. And the third thing is that they're people who are open. Uh, they're not closed. So, you know, some of the things I would have said on the retreat, I think, would have been challenging to people. Different ways of looking at the scripture, different things that insights that biblical scholars have had, different ways of thinking about some of the mysteries of the church and the mysteries of our faith. And we didn't change anything, but different ways of looking at them. And then thinking about some big questions, which are genuine questions about where God is in um, pain and suffering, for instance. And I found people very open. They, they were are prepared to listen and prepared to reflect on their own faith, which is just wonderful. And then finally, of course, because I'm a musician, I love all our liturgies. I love the Eucharist we had here today. I love the masses we had on the retreat. Um, I said at mass today that I would like to move the congregation from up here to North Sydney, where I am, and I'd like them to be my congregation on Sunday because the music, the energy, the life uh, that we're celebrating is so palpable. So I take, uh, sometimes do you think, you know, I come and give gifts to Samoa. I can honestly tell you, it is a wonderful exchange of gifts in coming here every single time. Mm -hmm. The practicality of uh, theology, uh, how people live theology in their daily lives. So you were um, bringing that question quite uh, openly uh, during the uh, discussion and mm. the retreat. Uh, how do you see that applies, uh, theology and how you live your life? as a Christian daily? Well, my, I made the point during the retreat that uh, the worst of spirituality is one which is divorced from our day-to-day -day living. And that's when people say that, you know, well, theology is all pie in the sky and it's head in the clouds. And sometimes people would say of Catholic theology and Catholic spirituality that it's very heady and it's all about thinking things through. And while thoughts matter, I'm a Jesuit, so I think I like thoughts. Actually, it's also, also meant to be an affair of the heart that we feel passionately and that we move intuitively into the world, that we, where the Holy Spirit sends us out. So the best of theology and the best of uh, um, spirituality always has an application to our daily life. Some applications might be more practical and real than others, like they're more obvious, and other ones um, are very clear from the word, are very um, are necessary nonetheless. So on the retreat, we looked, for instance, at, uh, firstly, we looked at Mary, the mother of God, and how Mary leads us to Jesus. Everywhere and always, the best of our tradition on Our Lady always doesn't stop there, but takes us on to her son, who is the savior of the world. And we looked at very practical things of Our Lady in the scriptures, which we share with our Protestant brothers and sisters, the 10 episodes of Our Lady in the scriptures, and how they can help us 
um, even think about some very difficult situations from losing a child in the temple when Mary and Joseph lost Jesus through to watching your child die and then being on mission going out to the world. So just three things of the ten. Then we had a look at the Lord himself and uh, we talked about his family tree and we looked at the um, Matthew's genealogy and how it's very complex indeed and how we can all find a place within uh, Christ's own family because even if we think our family uh, we're not worthy of him well his own background some of his own forebears were very complex people indeed and then we had a look at what does that mean in terms of very practical application to how we pray to the Lord how we see the Lord how we sing about the Lord and why that matters and we talked about iconography in, um, in stained glass in statues in prayer in images and in song then what flowed from that is we went on to talk about um, discernment, that when we're following the Lord, well, that's going to come down to how we choose in daily life to go with faith, hope, and love every single time, 1 Corinthians 12. And I introduced the retreat givers to St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, of which I'm a Jesuit, and so is the present Holy Father, Pope Francis, wonderful Jesuit, wonderful Pope. And uh, we, I introduced them to the rules for the discernment of spirits. Now, basically, that's just a big jargon word that says, how do I make good um, decisions in the light of my faith in Christ, following him? And those nine steps are really practical. And so we went through each of the nine steps looking at examples from daily life about how this might help us live our daily life to come closer to the Lord. And I finished that session by telling a wonderful story about um, how a homeless and alcoholic man was once the instrument of amazing grace in my life and in a young woman's life who had lost her child. And a very moving story. Um, then we went on to, after that, to have a look at um, uh, how we find God in pain and suffering. So it's all fine to say we want to follow the Lord when the going is good, but what about when the going gets tough? And um, I gave a story of a very personal moment in my own life when my sister was involved in a car accident at the age of 28 and became a quadriplegic and lost everything from her neck down. And for 28 years, she didn't move anything from her neck down. And she'd been one of the most generous, wonderful people, Catholics, Christians that I knew. She'd worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta. She'd worked with our Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory in Australia. She was generous beyond belief. And uh, for 28 years, she died two years ago. Um, but for 28 years, um, she was then couldn't move anything. And that forced me to think as a Jesuit, as a priest, how do we say a word of hope to people who are in terrible situations, who are in pain and suffering? And I wrote a book called Where the Hell is God? And then finally, the final session was about um, going out on mission. And I talked about how the church has three things we do on mission. A witness of word and example, inculturation, we take the culture seriously. So I take Australia very seriously. I was encouraging everyone here to take Samoa seriously, that we have to speak to that culture. And thirdly, that we are to liberate them, to set them free, so that faith doesn't bind us up to obey all these rules and regulations. It sets us free so that we might be the best son and daughter of God we can possibly be. So that was the retreat in a nutshell. And then we had beautiful Eucharists and uh, liturgies and prayer sessions as well. And it was wonderful to be able to take really complex theological ideas, speak about them simply, and then give examples and stories of how we live this out. Yeah, I think challenging is the word that <clears throat> came through the retreat and what you actually convey, because we had the benefit of being there the, the whole retreat. Even the title of your book, where the hell is God, mm. which came, I believe, at a very personal moment from your mother, That's right. where it just a combination of doubt and challenge and questioning what is happening to my daughter when she has been doing all these. How does that apply to daily living, where people would say, oh, it's the will of God, our faith and the will of God that we have these cyclones, we have the earthquakes, we have the wars, the beauty of the earth that he his creation, but then also we have all these painful and very bad things happening. How does that um, come together, given the challenge that your mother, uh, we, which you quoted in, as the name of your book, Where the Hell is God, at this particular time? I think where the hell is, where, to say where the hell is something in Australian, Irish, New Zealand, uh, English, 
culture is not very strong. Like my mother would never consider she's swearing or cussing by saying where the hell is something. If you say where the hell is something in the United States, that's considered to be swearing. Mm. And so actually the book was, uh, the title of the book was controversial and it may be in some more too. Maybe people are more sensitive to it. But as I told the story, uh, my mother said that to me after my, we found out that my sis, we were in the hospital room and then we were taken to an office after we found out what, how um, badly injured she was, how she was now quadriplegic. And my mother, who is a daily mass goer and a very devout Catholic, my mother turned to me and said, in great pain, it wasn't in anger, she said, where the hell is God? And she was just full of grief that the daughter she'd brought into the world, who'd been so generous, is now one of the poorest people we knew. So that's where the title comes from, and it's not meant to be an angry statement. It was meant it was a statement of great pain and great grief. Um, but to answer your question very directly, I made the important distinction which we make in Catholic theology, but we haven't been good in talking about it, that we believe God permits evil in the world. God doesn't send evil to the world. Because once we say God sends evil, then that means God's trading in evil. And we've never believed that. We've never, ever believed that. Because we say 1 John 1, 5, God is light, in him there is no darkness. So there can't be dark things in God. Now, we think for the sake of our human freedom, and indeed, even for all of creation, as St. Paul says in the letter of the Romans, that creation is in one act of giving birth. It's coming to um, evolving and giving birth itself. It's in process as well. Well, so are we. We're evolving, we're developing, we're growing. We're not finished, and we've obviously developed a lot in hundreds, if not millions of years. So we, um, uh, God has permitted evil to be in the world for the sake of our freedom, and maybe for creation to do what creation has to do. That means God permits evil in the world. That's complex enough and doesn't let God off the hook entirely. But that's very different to what some Catholics say all the time. Well, I got breast cancer. Well, that's God's will. Or the tsunami happened. That's God's will. Or AIDS came. Well, God didn't like gay people, so he sent AIDS. You know, Suicide. this is terrible theology. Yeah. Um, it's just awful because God can't send evil. That's actually what we believe. So why do tsunamis happen? Because the earth shelf moved. That's why tsunamis happen. Is God ultimately responsible? Yes, I guess the world could be made more perfectly than it is. But if it was perfect, it would be heaven. So we're always going to be less than heaven. So it's got to be somewhat imperfect for it to be the world. Because we're not in heaven yet. And the same is true of us. While God never wants us to do evil, he gave us free will. And the minute he gave creation free will, there was a possibility, and tragically one that we take too often, of doing the wrong thing, of being the wrong person, of being in a place where the wrong thing happens, and of supporting that. And so many of the things then we blame God for, we've created for ourselves and for our world. So I think we've got to be very careful about our theology at this point. And we have to say what we know. God doesn't send evil things. So when bad things happen to good people, when people say, why did your sister become a quadriplegic? Was that God's will? No, that was not God's will. Where God is present is in our response to her, that terrible car accident that left her a quadriplegic. The car accident wasn't God's will. Then God's will is to help her, help my mother and brother and me and all our family and friends to respond to her. And I have to say, it was one of the great acts of amazing grace I have ever seen in my life. Her faith, hope and love, my mother particularly, who nursed her for 27 of 28 years, one year in hospital, 27 <coughs> years at home, that, that's where amazing grace is found. And God enabled us all to respond with great gifts of generosity. So I found God in the love, in the forgiveness, in the gratitude that came as a result of my sister's accident. And it made me a better priest, a better Jesuit, a better Catholic, a better Christian. I think what came through the, uh, <clears throat> the retreat itself is how we, as pa the participants of the retreat, found it simply to understand because you had the very personal examples from your own life, the alcoholic, the your sister who actually went through this. So 
from that um, angle, we see there's a practicality to the whole thing. It's not highfalutin, it's not airy and fairy. Um, Christianity and our faith and how we live it day to day has an application. I think I, I borrow, I, I'm, I'm a shameless borrower of uh, the way I teach um, and the way I preach and, and uh, catechize is to follow the Lord. You know, Jesus was the great communicator and my area for the church is in communications. And uh, I work for the Bishops' Conference of Australia in communications. So I just model myself on the Lord. And what the Lord did was take the most profound things of God, speak about them simply, and often use everyday examples to make his point. So, for instance, Luke chapter 15 is probably the best example I know. They come along and they, the Pharisees and the Sadducees come along and attack Jesus for the company he's keeping. And uh, they say, you're tax collectors and prostitutes and you're with people who have bad reputations. And, you know, how can you say you are of God? And then to answer them, he gives three great parables. The woman with the lost coin, the shepherd with the lost sheep, and the, son, the father with the lost son, the prodigal son, and the other son. Actually, it's a parable of two sons. But he gives these three great examples. He said, if you want to know what my God is like, I want to tell you about a woman who loses a coin and sweeps it until she finds it and has great rejoicing. I want to tell you about a, a shepherd who will leave 99 sheep who could potentially be killed by the wolves to go after one to bring them back and brings them back on the shoulders. And I want to tell you about a father who watched and waited and hoped and prayed for his son to come back and then wouldn't even let him finish his apology and announces he's back, we're having a party. He said, that's what God's like. Well, that's what I try and do. Take a profound idea about what is God like and then give examples. Now, some of those examples are of my own experience and I have had extraordinary experience, which thank God I've been able to use in being able to communicate the things, the gospel and the things of the church and of God. And sometimes other examples come in, other stories come in. The reason that I think they matter is because people can then relate to them quickly. You don't have to wait another week or two to try and understand what was that guy on about. So it's an important principle, a very direct, clear story, and then I normally tease out a couple of truths of our faith that we need to understand and appreciate. And people do respond very well. What it does for them, of course, is often trigger their own story of grief, of pain, of rejoicing, of strange, wonderful people, very unexpected people who come into your life and reveal something quite different that you could never have expected. And then people have that experience as well. And so that we start to be very um, attentive then to the details of our life because God can be found in all the people, all the details of our everyday existence. Your own uh, personal uh, <coughs> background, you studied film and television, you are a communicator and you're a media person. Hmm. In today's world of technology and fast-paced, uh, how the world is moving and how the church finds itself within those um, uh, developments, do you think this could be part of what uh, the clergy and those working as missionaries for the church, they should, be, should they be having specific training in communication and be very simple and direct mm. in delivering the message? I do know that in almost every seminary in the world now, there is some training in communication. Whether it's enough is, uh, a, I would obviously think there should be more. But I know here in the Pacific, for instance, at the Pacific Regional Seminary in Suva, um, Bill um, uh, Falakono from um, Tonga goes there every year and has been doing it for 25 years, um, doing wonderful workshops in media and communications. And I think Bill does a fantastic job. And sometimes I've been honoured to support him over the years. Um, and uh, it's an honour to do it. And I know in every seminary in Australia we do at least some training in the media, but I think it's very important. Not because you have to become a media specialist, but you have to be comfortable and you have to be able to speak as we're speaking now um, about the things of God, but to an audience well beyond this church and to people who might be just tuning in, who aren't Catholic, who aren't Christian, who are formerly Catholic, who might just actually come in and have a listen to us. And we want to speak to them as well and say how much they're loved by God, how welcome they are, how we reach out to them too. We know the Lord is reaching out to them as well. 
um, because we've got to use every means that are available to, um, uh, to service the gospel. You know, I don't look at any media, film, television, social media, newspapers, radio, I don't look at any of it and think that God can't dwell there. The Holy Father, Pope Francis, has been very clear in his communications messages that every instrument given to us by God can be an instrument of God for God and the proclamation of the gospel. But we're not idiots. We all know that film, television, radio, newspapers and social media, online media, can do despicable things, terrible things. And as with everything, there is, you know, it's the coin. We have to keep coming up for the coin on the good side and use those things as uh, instruments. And it isn't just the clergy. I actually think, um, while I think they should be comfortable with the media, that's what I would hope, then they also need to be able to use very good media professionals around them to do what they're trained to do. Priests aren't trained to be media professionals, but they need to, the diocese, every diocese needs media professionals to do um, what they're trained to do, which is then to take their media professional skill and put it at the service of the proclamation of the gospel. And uh, because these are just new ways that the Lord has given us opportunities to proclaim the good news. And I want to take advantage of every single avenue I can. In terms of numbers, the church globally, the Catholic church, mm. what contribution can it have to change given what's happening to the world right now? Not only uh, well, there's no question that um, the Catholic Church in particular, it's the largest Christian family in the world. There are 2.2 billion Christians in the world. There is 1.15 billion Catholics, so we're just over 50%, almost 51, maybe 51% of the whole Christian family. And that gives us a heavy responsibility, I think. The Catholic Church is actually growing internationally. Now, in my country, and sadly in other countries, it's contracting. But in other parts of the world, it's expanding. And if imagine if all 1.1 billion Catholics actually lived the good news of Jesus Christ. Imagine if all 2.2 billion um, Christians, because more unites us than separates us. Now, I know tragically there's been terrible fights between Christian churches, but we all do believe in Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. We all believe in that. And we do believe in the Gospels, and we do believe in the proclamation of the good news. And that means we have to live it. So on the retreat, I was quoting Pope Francis, who said that we should firstly be people who are obedient. That is in terms of listening to the word of God and responding to it, very active listening. Secondly, we should be people of joy. And we need to tell our faces that we're happy. Sometimes Catholics can be a bit gloomy. I don't think that's true in the Pacific, actually, but it's true in Australia, I can assure you. Um, thirdly, we need to be people who are compassionate. I think. Our witness is never better than when we're serving the poor and the economically poor. And Pope Francis has been very strong on this, that we have no share in the gospel if we're not living uh, in service of the economically poor. And then um, care of the earth, that this is, we've been given this planet not to wreck it, but to pass it on. And in the Pacific, we need no uh, reminding of how climate change is affecting life. We only have to think of our brothers and sisters in Kiribati. Um, to know that, in fact, in my lifetime, they could be environmental refugees. This is a tragedy beyond belief. So the Pope has said to us, we were called to care for the earth, not wreck it. And we have to take that seriously. And then there are three great things. Being grateful, being forgiving. The heart of the gospel is forgiveness. And then being loving. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. On this hang all the law and the prophets. The law of Christianity, not from my lips, but from the Lord's own lips is to love. And so everything has to be judged on that criteria. That doesn't mean we don't take a stand because sometimes tough love means we take a stand for what we believe in and not everybody likes what we have to say, but it, it should be communicated as lovingly, as compassionately as possible. If we lived those things, if we lived obedience and gratitude, if we lived uh, the care of the earth and compassion and forgiveness and uh, uh, and love, we would change the world. All 2.2 billion Christians, or 1.1 billion Catholics would change the world. So there's the challenge. Not just coming to church, as good as that is. Not singing our hymns, reading our Bible, receiving the sacrament, our devotion to the saints and to Mary. They're all good things. I want to know what are we doing beyond those doors in changing the world 
into the kingdom of God that we were sent to do and sent to proclaim and sent to live. And we should do it with a spring in our step and a smile on our face because it's one of the greatest invitations we could ever receive. Samoa, only 200,000 people, less than 200,000 people living here and about 100,000 living overseas. Certainly they have a part to play. They have a part to play, especially in my country, and because uh, I, I know of a parish, a Jesuit parish in Western Sydney, called um, Holy Family Parish in um, Mount Druitt in Edmonton, and there they have a strong Catholic Samoan community. And I can tell you right now that the impact of that community on the wider parish in a Sydney parish has been immense. Firstly, in their music, secondly, in their joy, and thirdly, in their witness to family values and family life, which is so strong in your country. Sadly, we're losing that joy, family life, the witness to those wonderful values. So actually, I know the Samoan community in an Australian parish in Western Sydney can all already be leaven in the bread. We can't do it all on our own, but we can do the bit we're asked to do. And the Samoan community here and indeed uh, abroad can do their part and are doing their part and I pay a great tribute to them. Thank you so much, Father. It's been a great joy. Thank you for having me.